cool. Now, the handouts ought to be going around. Now, well, the only, well, not the only, one of the main, I guess, dangers of following Blair in Sunday school is comparing my handouts to his handouts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm just lazier than Blair, I think. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm minimalist on that. It's the introduction and the review, and that's about it. Not only that, you'll notice probably that, so I was down printing them off, and it ran out of paper. I thought, uh-oh, and so I punched a button on the printer, and it started to print again. I thought, I'm pretty proud of myself. Um, and then it printed the wrong direction. So some of your, your uh, papers are in the wrong direction, but that's okay. All you need basically is a piece of paper if you're going to be taking notes. Um, also, well, what we're studying, so we're going to be looking at the book of Zechariah. And so I want to start actually with a pop quiz from part one of Zechariah, which was almost two years ago. So, do I, it's a closed book with oh, no. Zechariah. No, so I think one of the first Sunday school series that I taught almost, maybe almost two years ago, I don't know if we were in here, we were in the sanctuary, was, was Zechariah, and we got through the first half, and as we'll remind ourselves, the book divides up nicely, pretty, pretty helpfully, into two or three main sections. And so we finished the first section, and then took a break in God's providence and, and whatnot. We are two years later, we're coming back around uh, to finish the book. However, also, God's providence, His grace, uh, a lot of new faces. And so we're going to take some time to review um, the first half. So if you, if you weren't here two years ago and you, you don't have your notes right on the tip of your tongue, uh, that's fine. Um, we'll take at least two weeks. Maybe three, but at least two, at least this week and next week, to review part one. I think we can get a pretty good handle on the first half, really chapters one through six of the book in a couple weeks. We'll uh, slow down at some points, move a little faster to others, but I think we should all be up to speed in two, maybe bleed into three weeks. But let's, why don't we pray uh, before we um, start? Uh, Larry Sykes, would you pray for us? Gracious Lord, we look forward to this uh, study in Zechariah. I pray that you teach us your ways from this book and help us to learn and be better students of your word through it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, thank you. So what I want to do today is two things. Two things today. First, uh, introduce the book or reintroduce the book. When was it written? Uh, what was going on in the history uh, of Israel, who wrote it, uh, how do we divide up the structure, what's the structure of the book, um, what are the main themes of the book, so we call all that introductory stuff, it's introductory matters. Then, I want to look at the first three visions, and you're probably thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? So we'll get there in just a minute, there's a series of visions that the prophet has, that is the first main section of the book. Eight visions, in fact, that span chapters 1 through 6. That's the first main chunk. And today, I want to summarize and just glance at the first three of those visions. So introduction and then the first three visions. So first, what's the book of Zechariah all about? Uh, when is it? Uh, what, what's going on? Uh, so first, when was... The book of Zechariah says. Does anybody remember, or just you might know off the top of your head, roughly speaking, when Zechariah, who is a prophet, a prophet of the Lord, uh, when he was ministering? Does anybody remember rough time period when Zechariah might have been ministering? About the time of Nehemiah. Very good. About the time of Nehemiah. Now, with. Uh, um, Yes, excellent. So we'll come back to that. Yeah, about the time of Nehemiah, what, any kind of rough ballpark of how many years before Christ? So that would have been about 430. So yeah, 430 or so. But Zechariah is actually about a generation before Nehemiah. So uh, Zechariah is, spans the year 520 to 519. So 520, and then it bleeds into 
519. So that's about 500 or years or so before the incarnation, uh, before the coming of Christ. Zechariah was one of the last Old Testament prophets. Zechariah is what we call a post-exilic book. Post meaning after, exilic, the exile. So it is a book after, excuse me, after the exile. Well, what was going on in the exile? So just a quick review of the history of Israel. In the year 586, if you're going to memorize dates, there's two or three in the Old Testament that are, are good to know and that are helpful. One is 586. That's the year that Babylon came in as a tool, instrument of God's judgment to bring judgment on his people, to take them into exile back to Babylon, and they destroyed the temple, which is important for our, for our study. So 586, the exile. So Israel's taken back into exile. Um, in the year 539, so a little bit after that, the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire, and some of the Israelites returned. So they returned from exile. So they returned from exile under Persian rule. And that is the setting for the book of Zechariah. Now, the Israelites have come back from exile. And the question is, what do we do now? That's kind of the question. What, what now? What do we do now? And when they got back, one of the first things they started to do was rebuild the temple. I mean, it, you know, Israel, their identity was, was wrapped up in, in the temple. And without the temple, they couldn't worship. No sacrifices, no worship. So if you're going to worship the Lord, you need the temple. So they begin to build the temple. But they soon give up. And this is the early chapters of Ezra. They soon give up. There's trial, hardship, um, so neighboring groups of peoples were, were oppressing them and were persecuting them, mocking them and ridiculing them. Who do you think you are? You know, what do you think you're doing? Um, we're going to stop you from doing this. And so they gave up building the temple to focus on themselves, to focus on building their own um, uh, houses and the like. Um, so they gave up disappointment, discouragement. Let me read you the first few chapters, first few verses of Haggai chapter 1. Haggai, small little book, next to the right before Zechariah. Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet were contemporaries. They were ministering at the same time. So when you think Haggai, Zechariah, there's a lot of overlap, um, similar themes that they talk about. So let me read you Haggai chapter 1, uh, just the first five verses. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Zerubbabel and Joshua, they were the leaders in Israel. Uh, they were the two figures leading Israel, the first generation at least, after the exile. Joshua, as we'll talk about, a king kind of guy. I'm sorry, no, Joshua's the priest. Zerubbabel, king guy. Joshua, he's the priest. And then what was the message the Lord gave through Haggai? Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, the pe these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. In other words, things have gotten hard. I want to focus on my own house. We'll get back to the Lord's house a little bit later. Once I kind of get my affairs in order, maybe once some of the hardship and the trials cool off, that sounds like a better time to get back to rebuilding the temple. Um, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? That's one of the more famous verses from Haggai. Uh, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So you're working on beautifying your paneled, your fancy, your fancy houses while the Lord's house lies in ruins. 
Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's another well-known verse from, from Haggai. Consider your ways, repent. And they, they, heed, they heed the word of the prophets, and they repent, and they get back to building, back to building the temple. Um, so if Haggai's call is to rebuild the temple, uh, and the temple is rebuilt in the year 515, so that might be another um, year to, to remember, 515 is when the second temple was rebuilt. Zechariah's message is a little bit different. So Haggai's message is, don't worry about your paneled houses. Consider your ways. Um, the Lord's house lies in ruins. Get back to work. Zechariah's message, at the same time as Haggai, exact same time, uh, is a little bit different. Zechariah's message is threefold. So three main things Zechariah wants to teach us and the people um, uh, uh, post-exile. The first is to repent. To repent. Look at Zechariah. Look at the first few, few verses. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. That's just language of repentance. Return to me, and I will return to you. Think 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is like an Old Testament version of 1 John 1, 9. Return to me, and I will return to you. So the first main thing of Zechariah's book, repent. The Lord just doesn't want a building. He wants your hearts. He doesn't just want you going through the motions. He wants all of you. He wants your hearts as you bring your sacrifices, etc. A second, the second main point of Zechariah that we'll think about more in just a few moments is to reassure them that God has not forgotten them. To reassure God's people that God hasn't forgotten them. What might the Israelites have been thinking after they return from exile, what are some things that might have been going through their minds after the Lord let them come back from exile? What are some, any thoughts? What, what, how might their spiritual condition have been? Was there a king reigning on the throne? No. So what might they be thinking? Didn't God make some promises to them about, about a king? So they might be thinking, where, where's the king? Lord, where's the king? Where, where, what of your promises? You have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Have you forgotten us? That and those kinds of questions are the kind of questions that set the background to all of the writers after the exile. Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi three last, you know, right at the end of your Old Testament. Where is God? What of his promises? He brought us back that we're small, there's no king, we're facing oppression, we're facing persecution. Where is he? And Zechariah wants to remind them, and us, as we'll see, that God has not forgotten them. That his eye is always on his people. And he uses kind of mysterious visions to communicate that very basic truth that God has not forgotten you. And we need to be reminded of that as well. I mean, this is, you know, similar to what we talked about in, in, in the sermon this morning. How often do we think, Lord, where are your promises? Have you forgotten me? And so Zechariah's message to Israel, however many generations ago, is the message that we need to hear, that God's eye is always on his people, that his church is the apple of his eye. And in fact, that's a, a phrase that he'll use in, in chapter 2. That's the second main point of the book. Repent, I haven't forgotten you. And then third, to move them forward to the Messiah. To, to drive them forward to the coming Messiah. And this is the second half of the book that we didn't get to in part one. And this is all, all the great prophecies that are read during 
lessons and carols and around Christmas time, all these great prophets, uh, these great verses from the second half of the book of Zechariah are read, and we'll get there later. So three things. Repent. The Lord hasn't forgotten his people, and to point them forward to the coming Messiah, to the coming King. So just quick, re quick review on some of the basics of, um, of the book. Um, what about the structure? How do we break down the book? Three main sections. There's an introduction. Uh, there's what's called the night visions, because there are visions given to Zechariah at night, so the night visions. And then the third uh, part is the coming king. So a brief introduction, verses 1 through 6, the visions, uh, which is, takes us through chapter 6, chapter 7 and 8, there's kind of a, a transition we'll get to later, and then 9.14. So visions, king, put it that way, Messiah, first half, king, King Jesus, the second half. Okay, everybody, we all clear so far? This introductory stuff. So let's think about uh, Zechariah's first three visions. I said there's eight visions, eight visions in the book, and, and this is this is important. Zechariah, the first half especially of the book of Zechariah, is what we call apocalyptic. That's talking about the genre. What kind of writing is it? There's different genres in the Bible. There's history, uh, historical, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, the Chronicles, there's history, there's law, Ten Commandments, a lot of Leviticus, there's legal stuff, there's poetry, the Psalms, um, there's wisdom, which is a little bit different, think of the Proverbs. Apocalyptic is a specific kind of writing, genre, that is characterized by visions. What, what other book of the Bible um, might also be uh, characterized as apocalyptic. Any other books of the Bible that have a lot of visions? Daniel, Daniel right. We, we've seen a lot of visions in the book of Daniel. Daniel, uh, especially the second half of Daniel, all of it really, but especially the second half, is apocalyptic. Daniel's given visions. Also, there's um, typically an, an angel that is kind of a, a, a mediator. The, the Lord gives his vision often through an angel that will help interpret the vision. Very characteristic of, of apocalyptic kind of writing. What else? So there's Daniel, there's Zechariah. Any other ones? Yep. Jim. Revelation. Rev absolutely. Revelation is kind of a classic um, um, example of apocalyptic literature. In fact, it's called the Apocalypse of John. So right there in the very title, uh, there's a, a reminder that we ought to read the book of Revelation as we read apocalyptic literature, expecting visions and symbolism, um, which is, in fact, what we find. Is, yep, what are you saying? Would elements of Ezekiel also be apocalyptic? Yep, Ezekiel is the other one I was going to. Um, Ezekiel has visions, and all kinds of strange things happen in these visions. Um, and we you know, try to figure out what those visions mean. So apocalyptic genre um, characterizes Zechariah. One other thing about... This, this kind of writing is apocalyptic literature in the Bible often gets at the big picture of things. The big picture of things, how is it all going to turn out? And we see that in Ezekiel. Uh, we see that in Daniel. If you remember the, what we talked about in Daniel, the visions that Daniel gets are big picture, kind of all of history, sweeping views of history. You know, this empire is going to rise, this empire, this empire. Then there's the, the, the son of man comes, or the, the rock, the uncut rock that destroys the, the, the image and then uh, grows to a world-filling mountain. That's all kind of big, apocalyptic, sweeping, grand, pointing us forward. All of that is characteristic of... Zechariah, Revelation, um, Daniel, for example. Um, okay, as I said, there's eight, eight visions. And as we'll see, the, the visions are organized in a very specific way. They're kind of like a bracket. So vision one, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is similar to vision eight. Vision one, vision eight. 
And right in the middle, the two central visions are visions four and five. So one, two, three. Then you get to the very center, four and five. And the last three, six, seven, and eight. And so visions four and five are right at the core. And those are the visions that probably we're more familiar with. Uh, it's the vision of Joshua, uh, the high priest, and he's clothed in filthy garments, and his garments are taken off, and he puts on beautiful uh, white, white garments, a beautiful Old Testament picture of justification. And then um, the next vision, five, talks about Zerubbabel, the king. So the two central visions of the first half talk about the priest and the king. So that should... our Minds should start thinking. Priests and kings are very important. And of course, we move forward to Jesus, who is our true priest king. So we'll see how all that bears out uh, in just a little bit. But just note there's a structure uh, to the visions. One is, is kind of bracketed by eight, uh, the t standing at the right in the middle for visions four and five. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, the, it might take us three weeks to do the to do the introduction. I always end up going slower, and I'm probably some of this is probably boring you with just with review. But let's dive in and look at the first few first uh, at least one or two visions. So the first vision, uh, I'm looking at the ESV, and it's called a vision of a horseman. The main point of the first vision is that God has not forgotten His people. So that's a one sentence summary of the first uh, of verses 7 through uh, through 17. 7 through 17. God has not forgotten his people. Let me read it and make a couple brief comments, and then we'll, we'll keep going. The 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, so we're in 519. So that's 519 years before Jesus. Um, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, I saw in the night, there's a night vision, and behold, a man riding on a red horse who was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. Behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. So we have, uh, in this vision, we have horses and riders. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel, so there's the kind of the interpreting angel, uh, the angel who talked with me to talked with me, said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Verse 11, And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. So stop there. So the vision, starting off, uh, Zechariah sees horses and their riders in kind of in a glen uh, in the night and he says who are these and what are they doing well these are the ones sent by the Lord to patrol the earth they went to survey the scene um, they're kind of the, to scout the lay of the land in the world like the lay of the land in the world and what was their report what was their report uh, verse 11 all the earth remains at rest. Let's think about that for just a moment. Is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It might be hard to kind of, to kind of figure it out. Just if, like, is this good or bad, right? I mean, Jesus says, I will give you rest. I mean, so typically rest is a good thing. We all like rest. Um, but this rest here, is this a good rest or a, not a good rest? Any thoughts on what, uh, what's going on there? saying peace, peace, when there is no peace, right? Like there's, there's rest when there shouldn't be because things aren't right for Israel. Absolutely. Everybody hear that. So it's as if the nations are at rest, who's not at rest? Who's certainly not at rest? Israel. Israel. So you have God's people. They are not at rest. The rest of the surrounding world, you could also, you could also translate that at ease. So God's people are not at ease. They are the ones, they're, they're questioning, they're wondering, they're, they're small, they're facing opposition, they're asking, what of God's promises? Lord, where are you? While the rest of the world is at rest. It's as if this is the opposite of the way things ought to be. God, God has promised his people rest, and those who do not belong to him are certainly not at ease. 
uh, because, you know, because judgment's coming. So the, the, the survey that these patrolling horses bring back is that um, things are, in a sense, not as they should be. It's almost, in fact, opposite as we would expect things to be. And as things are with the coming of Christ, as things will be in glory uh, forever uh, when Jesus returns. So let's move on. Andrew the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long we have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years. So this angel of the Lord begins to intercede. Lord, how long? How long is this going to last? Then note verse 13. The Lord answered gracious and comforting words. So that's a, that's a kind of a sweet, um, sweet verse right there in the midst of, of this things aren't going well. The Lord answered gracious and comforting words that Zechariah was to give to his people. Um, what are those words? The angel who talked with me said to me, cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Skip down to verse 17. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again. So in the future, my city shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So the Lord says, basically he's saying, I haven't forgotten you. Remember, that's, that's arguably the great question post-exile. Have you forgotten me? And the gracious and comforting words the Lord gives to his people and to us is, I haven't forgotten you. I see, I know what's going on. And all that's going on implied is under my sovereign hand. So that is kind of the first vision uh, introducing the eight is I haven't forgotten you I see you um, I, I'm aware of what's going on and it's not going to last forever my cities again will overflow with prosperity and, and I'm going to ask this many times throughout the book when do these words find their fulfillment and they find the fulfillment of course in Christ in the New Testament in the coming of Jesus and his first coming and his second coming. We'll see more of that in just a moment. So I know I'm moving pretty quickly, but any questions on just that first vision? We're not getting every detail. I want us to have a good grasp kind of on the, on the main point. Any thoughts, questions on that first vision? Everybody on board? Okay, let's move on. Second vision. This one's a lot shorter. Verses 18 through 20, 21. The main point of the second vision is God's enemies will face judgment. It's a one sentence summary of that second vision. My eye is always on my people, vision one. And my enemies' judgment will come. The Lord used, in fact, it's really interesting. Uh, if you look back in verse. 15 of, of chapter 1. While I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. So the Lord used wicked pagan nations sovereignly as his instrument of discipline. There's a thousand verses we can look at to support that. But um, the Lord used Babylon, Assyria, Persia as his tools to discipline his wayward people Israel, but when it says they furthered it, it's the idea of that their persecution kept going on and on and on. They, they, were, they were, in a sense, went far beyond um, what they should have. And so those enemies, judgment is going to come on them. So let's look, let's look at verses 18 to 21. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. What do horns symbolize in the Bible? Kingdoms, yeah, are these weak kingdoms or big, strong kingdoms? <coughs> strong, kingdom. strong kingdoms. Yeah, horns symbolize strength, strong kingdoms um, all throughout the Bible. Horns symbolize strength. I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah 
Israel, and Jerusalem. So these are symbolized God's enemies, um, symbolizing those nations uh, who have opposed the Lord and his purposes. And what's going, to, what's going to become of them? Remember, this time, God's people were small, marginalized, being oppressed, hurting, doubting, questioning. What's going to... What's, what is the ultimate end of, of um, those who oppose the Lord? Verse 20. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one raised his hand. And these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Again, we're, we're, this is symbolic. So four craftsmen. Uh, to come and to deal fully and finally and sufficiently with the enemies of God. So this is a picture, prophetic picture, of the ultimate end of God's enemies. Judgment. And we, we, you know, we see this in the New Testament, book of Revelation. Um, so judgment is coming on God's enemies. Everybody, everybody with me? So we can, we can get these. These aren't, these aren't too, too challenging. Things, things do get a little bit... A little bit more challenging. So we'll do vision three. I think we think we're good. So let's do uh, vision three. And vision three is awesome. It's just fantastic. Yep. Why craftsman? Um, it's, it's metal worker. It's a. It's, if I remember correctly, it's a generic term. Um, who 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 work with metal? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure why metal workers, but uh, perhaps you know there were those who who deal and kind of domesticate animals, you know, because horns are associated with, with animals, strong animals, and craftsmen are those who are in the business of kind of subduing and domesticating the animals on which the horns are found. So that's, that's my best guess. So, all right, any, any other thoughts? Okay, let's look at vision three. Vision three is fantastic. So if vision two talks about the ultimate end of God's enemies, vision three asks the question, what about God's people? What of the ultimate end of God's people? So vision two is kind of judgment, cursing. Vision three is we might call it blessing. Uh, so let's read through vision three, and we'll take just a few minutes to, um, uh, to think and talk about it. All right, beginning in chapter 2. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. I got a guy kind of with a long um, measuring tape, in a sense. Then I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. Why, why would he be measuring Jerusalem? Any thoughts? Just Why would he go measure the city? Guesses? You're all pondering. Yep. No? You can say Revelation, they measure the New Jerusalem also. Yeah, okay. Yep, so it, very interesting. So Revelation, there's some measuring that goes on in Revelation. In fact, there's a lot of, of overlap, as you might expect, between Zechariah and Daniel and Ezekiel and in Revelation. They're all the same type of writing. So there's measuring that goes on in, in, uh, in Revelation. See how big it is. Basically, yeah, Jim? For the reader, it just shows size, right? It was a big number. You yep. the readers see it's a really big size. I suppose for the time, if you lay something out, one of the first things you do is you send out a surveyor. Yep. Survey yep. the site and set it up. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, go ahead, Joe. Well, he goes from measuring to speaking of it being as a village without walls. Now, oh, you were reading ahead, yes. Yeah. Oh. That's okay. That's all right. You cheated. No, I'm kidding. So, 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 so you're right. I think the idea is you measure it. Okay, now you think about how big it is, and it's going to be much bigger. Yeah, so it's, it's been just to see if it's big enough. Things are going to be so great and glorious. Is it big enough? So just, that's why they're going to measure. Is it big enough to hold all the grandness and glorious things that God's going to do. So let's, um, 
And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width, what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward. Another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, Run and say to the, that young man, like, it's almost as if go catch up to him and say, It's going to be even bigger than you can imagine. That's kind of the, the scene that, that's going on. Run and say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls. It'll be so big that there'll be no walls. You, your walls makes it too small, in a sense. Um, because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. Again, this is a symbolic, prophetic picture of the grandness and glories of God's future coming kingdom. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. Okay, so what, what is a danger um, if the city doesn't have walls? Attack from the outside. Attack from the outside, right? We all see those pictures and, you know, strong walls surrounding, um, surrounding a, a, a country or a kingdom. Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah comes back to do what? You rebuild the walls. And so they rebuild the walls for protection. But this city, this kingdom is so grand, we can't have walls. Well, that leaves it open to, open to, to attack. So what happens? Um, I will be to her a wall of fire. I will be the one who defends my kingdom. So in other words, don't worry. I will protect my people. I will build my church. The gates of hell will never prevail against it. You know, Matthew uh, 16. So it's going to be so big and so grand, no walls, walls won't do, but don't fear, I will be the one who protects, uh, who protects my people. Again, it's just beautiful, prophetic picture. And did that bring up images of what happened in the Exodus, with God protecting them with pillar of fire? Absolutely, very good. Yeah, so think of the Exodus, remember uh, Israel comes out in the Exodus, and what's in front of them is the sea. What's behind them is uh, the, the coming uh, Egyptian army. But the Lord, it's, like, it's a really cool picture. The Lord kind of hovers down behind his people as that, as that flaming, uh, kind of a flaming wall to protect his people from the encroaching Egyptian army. Yeah, great point, Nathan. So there's similar imagery. That if we had more time, we could pause and kind of look up you know, a lot of these cross-references. But the Lord protects his people, image of the flaming fire, Guarding and protecting his people. Uh, where do we see this kind of the image of fire guarding something? The first, what's the first place in the Bible we see that? The garden. The garden. Yeah. What's going on in the garden? Well, God barred their reentry. Right. Yeah. God barred their reentry, kind of with the, with the flaming sword. This is like the opposite in a sense. So this isn't to keep. Um, this is to keep you know kind of keep the enemies out, so to speak, as opposed to. Preventing Adam and Eve to get back in. This is going to keep the enemies enemies out. Because um, as God's people, we are now reconciled. We are friends, friends with the Lord. So back to 4 and 5. Um, shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. Well, you could stop. I mean, you, that's... That's the Bible. There's the Bible in one phrase. I will be her, you know, the glory in her, in her midst. Um, we touched on this this morning in the sermon, Psalm 90. You know, satisfy her in the morning um, you know, with your steadfast love. That, that God with us in our midst, communing with him, that is the purpose and the, the, the main thrust of the whole Bible. That was what was held out to Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, that was what was restored. Fellowship, communion with God is what was restored through the work of Christ. Was, was pictured and prefigured all throughout the Old Testament. And that is what will be ultimately realized in glory, in heaven. The new heavens and the new earth. And we will see Jesus face to face. In fact, there's a commentary written on Zechariah called Glory in Her Midst. And so... Beautiful phrase that really captures and summarizes the entire sweep of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Um, I will be the glory in her midst. John 1.14. Remember John 1.14? Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
Um, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, what is, what is Jesus called, especially Christmas time, Matthew 1, 23 from Isaiah? Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the very glory of God in our midst. The ascended Jesus has given us um, his representative agent, the Spirit. So God is with us by means of his Spirit, even now, until glory. So that, I mean, that little phrase, again, that's, that's the Bible um, in, in a nutshell. Um, okay, so vision one, I haven't forgotten you. Vision two, judgment will come to God's enemies. Vision three, the ultimate end of God's people is God's glory, God dwelling with his people. Um, again, this points us forward to the, to the fulfillment in the first and second comings of Christ. Let's just um, finish up uh, the last few verses, and then, and then we'll see if there's any questions and, and call, it, call it a day. So verse six, up, up. This is a call to repent. Up, up, flee from the land of the north. That's Babylon. In, in context. Flee from the land of the north, declare, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds. That's the exile. In the exile, God spread his people. Um, up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory he sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. There's a beautiful little phrase. The church is the apple of God's eye. That's an echo um, or reference to, remember what the Lord said to Abraham. The one who blesses you, I will bless. And the one who curses you, I will curse. The one who harms you, I will, I will come against. Because you, my people, you are the apple of my eye. The Lord loves the gates of Zion, as it says in Psalm, in Psalm 87. Um, verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. So there's the third vision. Again, this beautiful picture, ultimate end, what awaits God's people, his, his glory is coming in the kingdom. Any thoughts? Now we've just we've kind of blazed through an introduction in these first three visions, but if I have a good, good handle, a good grasp, at least an introductory level of what's going on, any questions or thoughts on anything that we've covered thus far? I know I'm moving kind of quickly. Yeah, I just have one. Yeah. So the, the judgments of the, uh, the other uh, empires, mm -hmm. um, is that referencing when they actually fell or the same judgment we have to come for them to determine? I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, I think it's, it's, for example, the Lord brought judgment on Babylon when Persia conquered them. So I think it's, you know, oftentimes in the, with the prophets, we talk about multiple kind of levels of fulfillment. So I think Babylon faced judgment when Persia, in history, actually conquered them. But as we read through our Bibles, we know that Babylon in the New Testament comes to symbolize kind of all of God's enemies. <coughs> Babylon the harlot, for example, in the book of Revelation is a picture of all of God's enemies. So while there are historical fulfillments that we see, I think ultimately the final fulfillment is we find in the second coming in the final judgment. Good question, though. Yeah, Jim? So my question is a similar answer to the last one, but so right at the end, many nations join to them. So is this the church age? Is this the new heavens and the new earth? Yeah. All of the above? I guess, yes. Okay. <laughs> All the above. So much of the prophets and what the prophets do in pointing us forward fleshes out with the first and second coming of Christ, with what's called the already and the not yet. So... Um, we are living in an age when the gospel goes out to the nations. Um, and the nations are, in a sense, being brought into the kingdom of God. But um, that's being fulfilled in our midst right now. It began at Pentecost. And Paul's missionary journeys as the gospel exploded and went to the 
than the farthest corners of the globe. But ult, it finds its final kind of zenith, ultimate fulfillment in, in the new heavens and new earth when all pe people from all tribes, tongues, peoples, and nations will be together um, worshiping the Lord forever in glory. So it's, it's a yes of both and. Um, as the prophets were looking for, they didn't have all the details that, that we do um, about kind of the first and second coming of, of the Lord and his kingdom. But looking back, we can see it's a, a both and. So, good question. Make sense? Is that helpful? All right, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up. We can talk afterwards. Next, next week... Uh, we will uh, look at the, we'll see how time goes, but at least uh, the next several visions, um, and that will give us a good kind of um, um, runway to take off to the new, new material in the second half. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for these books that, Father, we confess we might not have spent as much time in as other portions of your word. And Father, the promises and the assurances that you gave to your people so long ago, uh, you give to us today. So we ask the same questions. And may your word give assurance to us as it has to your people throughout the ages. That you always see us. That you never forget your people. That we are the apple of your eye. That you are the God of justice. And those who oppose you, that, that, that judgment will come. But Father, as well, what, what awaits us is beautiful, glorious kingdom that has been brought in already uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you use, O oh Lord, sinners like us as instruments to spread the gospel to the nations. May we know that and may we seek to fill that, fulfill that in the power of your spirit. May that future of you dwelling with us, be an encouragement to us today and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with me. Have a good...